Back on the road, our journey across Ghana continues. According to Richard Harvey, true trailblazing here must start with commodities and commerce driving economic growth. We arrive at the Lambusier community farm. Agriculture is a way of life and livelihood for 86% of the people in rural Ghana. And as we've seen, it's potentially a way of business. This farm is taking agriculture to the next level as a planned, profit-making venture. Most of what is sown here is for trade. Owner Tong gives Richard a tour. This onion. Yeah. Not only does this farm grow all kinds of vegetables and fruits, but it also sprouts its own seed supply. These onion stalks are harvested not for market, but for their seeds, a strategy that sacrifices short-term profits, but reaps long-term rewards. So yes. though you'll be losing um, at the market, Crop, yep. but you are getting your own seed. Yeah. Because the seed now is very expensive. Small and medium farm enterprises like this are cultivating a better business model and way of life in rural communities. You know, the old rule in any business, I do what I see my boss doing. So this gives local people something to aspire to, a better way of doing things, and draws in people who would otherwise drift out of this pile of wood, maybe down to some of the urban sprawl in search of extra work. This farming operation may be larger, lusher, and more ambitious than the dry season garden we visited earlier, but the challenges are the same. All around us, just outside the farm's fences, is proof of how climate change has ravaged and transformed this land in a relatively short period of time. Just 35 years ago, this entire area, believe it or not, used to be forest. I was told that crocodiles used to be a hazard here. And just 10 years ago, some people in the region, they used to catch frogs and sometimes eat them. And now, what do you have? Very, very dry, barren, hard soil. Different place, same soil, same story. Just like digging for boreholes, farming here is a constant battle to reclaim the land. As we leave, we pass a small pond, a reminder of what this terrain used to look like. The crocodiles, though, have long gone. We move on, eager to see where the farm's food basket ends up. Produce from local growers is sold roadside in towns and also at the larger markets. This move into the world of commerce and competition is a significant stepping stone for people to eventually trade their food internationally and fetch higher prices. Trading their way out of difficulty is crucial for Africa. We're not talking about creating a continent that is going to be a permanent recipient of aid. That, that's a disaster for the world. It's, 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 it's a disaster for the people here uh, and it creates entirely the wrong um, culture within, within the society. Richard and I next head out to Jirapa to visit the Janvuri community for a look at a microfinance project helping to support the community and empower its women. The majority of Ghana is best known for its cocoa, but here in the upper west region of the country, where it's a lot drier, they're counting on Shia butter made from the Shia nut as potential big export business. Shia butter is the key ingredient in beauty creams and cosmetics marketed for their moisturizing ability and skin softening effects. You can feel the sort of butter in it already. From this mud hut production base, women churn, crush, and grind the nuts into shea butter in a back-breaking, seven-stage, all-day marathon in the blistering heat. I mean, it's very, it's, very hot. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very hot. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're standing at about 40 degrees yeah. in the shade, I guess, and then we've got a little fire going underneath, so this is, this is pretty warm work. All this warm work results in a big ball of unrefined shea butter. Could you ask the woman, do they find that there are many people that are willing to pay for these products now? Okay. That's uh, locally, people come to buy for cooking. But moving it out of their community, then they can sell it better. Big buyers of West Africa's Shia butter include global beauty giants L'Oreal, L'Occitane, and The Body Shop. But here in Janvuri, 
machinery and some good old business backing are still needed to supply that caliber of clientele. So this is a prime example of microfinancing where it's best? Yeah, microfinance has, has, has started this product and the opportunity is for it to grow essentially into an international business. This is one of the things that Africa can do and has an almost unlimited capacity for expansion. So where's the sticking point? Simply the availability. You know, we are absolutely at the far end of Ghana. Just bringing the small amount of money here is going to cost a fair bit of money in transport, and then people only want to borrow $10. So getting a scale is quite difficult. But as the activity in the area builds up, you start to get into a virtuous spiral in which your overheads start to fall because you've got more loans. And if you can, you want to make a large portion of your loans to women because they seem to be, experience has shown across Africa, much better at using the money responsibly, running the business well, and understanding that if they pay this loan back, then next time they can borrow some more. And Richard tells me there's an added benefit to supporting the Shia butter business in particular. It's a business which is also great for the environment, encouraging the planting of these trees, which in turn is helping with temperature and with rain and with soil erosion. While demand for Shia butter may help with the reforestation of trees, most of what we see in Ghana is the reverse, deforestation, even in the greener south. We see the impact wherever we go in, in Africa. This area used to be covered with trees. Now there's just one lone tree left standing and the tree line has receded. Almost 2% or 22,000 hectares of Ghana's forest are depleted every year. It's dreadful. It's like the rape of the planet, actually. Trees fall victim to the common practice of slash and burn agriculture and hunting. Others are chopped down for firewood. During our travels, we constantly come across women carrying stacks of wood. If you go into the village itself, you find also heaps of firewood, because it's a symbol of a woman's, a married woman's resourcefulness, if she has a good heap of firewood. The amount of wood a woman has piled outside her home is a measure of her status in the community. Wood equals wealth here. And wood also equals fuel. It's often burned for charcoal. Wood fuel consumption provides a staggering 70% of Ghana's total energy supply. In rural parts where there's limited access to modern energy sources like gas or electricity, more than 90% of households use firewood for charcoal or cooking. This reliance on trees is extensive. Beyond the home, wood and charcoal fuel businesses. From informal enterprises such as the making of local brews and grain alcohol, to commercial logging and timber exporting. We see truck after truck loaded down with trees. At the current rate, Ghana is likely to consume more than 25 million tons of wood fuel by 2020. All such practices lead to degradation of the forest, and fewer trees means less rain. And all this means a serious threat to the ecosystems of the country. Natural habitats and wildlife could be lost. And that's going to have an impact to a global level. Deforestation is going to affect us all. We can't sit by and just let this deforestation occur without our active involvement. That means getting the local people actively involved and invested in the process. It's a simple point, but one that outside organizations often miss. If those local communities are not in the driver's seat, then all the efforts that we bring in terms of resources, technical advice, strategic advice, just becomes like a, a big rug being pulled from under, under those communities. They have to have an ownership and a participation and a belief that it's really coming from them. Our journey next takes us to a village in Zambesi where we're treated to another hand-waving, hip-shaking welcome. This community, though, has been hit hard by deforestation and desertification. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Richard meets the elders and community stakeholders and initiates a discussion on strategic planning. We have been looking forward to coming and learning from you what you are doing to reduce the risks for the future. I've always thought in the city that communication was the absolutely vital ingredient of every chief executive. If you're trying to convince a board of directors that this new strategy is a good idea, it's not very different from trying to convince a group of village headmen if they took these measures then they could reduce the deforestation in their district. 
So uh, tell me how this works. What, After the community meeting, Richard gets a demonstration about how people create candles for home lighting. This prompts an unexpected discovery about what's growing wild under the most extreme conditions in the village's own backyard. So that they discovered biofuel you know, two generations ago. <laughs> That's amazing, just amazing. Richard, this place is desolate. It's dry, it's hot, it's barren. Why are you so excited about it? We're actually standing in the middle of a biofuel plantation. This is Jatropha, these are the beans, and the people of this village have just been telling me they've known for more than two generations, they talk about their grandfathers teaching them, that they can make a candle with these beans. What they really don't know yet is that we can drive cars around in the West. So we're standing both in a problem for Africa and perhaps a solution. What this could do is the double whammy of reclaiming this barren lost landscape, stop it just degrading completely and offer that kind of economic fill up that an economy like Ghana could do with. We've literally stumbled onto a natural biofuel field. It's a resource with untapped potential. If the community actually plants more of these trees, they can not only rehabilitate the land, but also revive the economy. There are opportunities, there are solutions. They need some careful thought and careful agreement and management with the community. But there are still ways in which business can be made to work to change those people's existence. Viable business opportunities like agriculture, like shea butter, like biofuel, can make money and improve lives here beyond the subsistence level of production. This in turn means that the people we've met will have cash to spend. It's a recipe for prosperity for Africa that Richard says can also be a recipe for profits for the companies that get involved. We're beginning to see fair trade making a significant impact and that is set to blossom. Richard got to the top at Aviva by being a shrewd businessman first and foremost. And this, he says, is the bottom line. Why businesses should engage in what's happening a world away probably the single biggest driving factor is their customers care. We have created climate change in the West, it's doing terrible damage across Africa and I think as people increasingly understand that they'll want the suppliers of the goods they consume to be playing their part in putting back and putting right some of that damage. During our week here we've seen the struggles on the ground, the wasted land and the people living hand to mouth. But we've also witnessed the region's potential, the people optimistic and hard at work, the businesses starting up, the marketplaces emerging. The question now is, can Africa ever emerge as the next China or India? Richard says businesses need to wake up to that very real possibility. They overlook Africa at their peril. Africa has the capacity to create an African lion to chase the Asian tiger. This is the message that Richard is working to convey to his colleagues back home. That Africa is far from a charity case, and he hopes to inspire others to take the journey to find out. Hey, how are you? What I do know is I've been bitten by the bug. Hopefully some of my enthusiasm and some of the things I've learned can be shared by the wider audience that will be able to make a difference. So what I will be trying to encourage other CEOs to do is to take the two or three day slot in their diary, which might otherwise have been that trip to New York or the jetting off to Singapore, and actually just, just take it to come and have a look because seeing is believing. It is possible to get up close and personal in a very short time and they really get a feel for both what can be done and actually of course what to avoid.